The following is a presentation of the Healthcare Facilities Network. Hello and welcome to the Healthcare Facilities Network. I am your host, Peter Martin, Vice President of Business Development at CREF. CREF has offices in Boston, Massachusetts, Dallas, Texas, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and Salt Lake City, Utah. I am here on site at the New England Healthcare Engineers 2024 Fall Conference. We are in beautiful Stowe, Vermont. My guest is Paul DeVillar. Paul is Director of Plant Operations at Leahy Medical Center in Burlington, Massachusetts. Leahy is part of the Beth Israel Leahy Health System. Paul is also the President of the New England Healthcare Engineer Society for 2024. Paul, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. I've been trying to get Paul on for a long, <laughs> for a long time, yeah. and I figured, well, we're both captive up here. Stowe, Vermont is beautiful, and so Paul took 30 minutes out of his busy schedule to speak with me. Paul, we'll, we'll talk about the conference. But Paul and I have known each other for a while, going back to the recruiting world. And one story about you, and I think it's interesting, it's the type of leader I think he is. Um, we were talking about a prospective job, not this one, it was, it was prior to this. And I remember Paul told me a story uh, trying to say who he was, and, and you said, if my guys need me to broom, I'm gonna broom. If I gotta pick up a broom and sweep, I'll do it. If I gotta move a gurney, I'll do it. And my expectations for my guys are the same, and that's always, always stuck with me. What's your, Paul, uh, how'd you come to that philosophy as a leader? What about you? makes you just jump in and, and get right in there with the guys and work for the good? Um, well, I'd say uh, some of it, you know, my, my upbringing, you know, the way that I was, I was raised. Um, also, I, I came up, you know, uh, through the trades. So uh, I'm a licensed electrician. Uh, that's how I kind of, I came into this, into the healthcare world, like working in and around, you know, healthcare organizations. Um, so it was always something that it was, I was part of the guys, and, you know, this is the extra napkin, quite honestly. <laughs> um, so I, I really don't look at it as, in, you know, their job, my job, it's our job to do the right thing. And, and uh, uh, you know, obviously, I, I, I like not to sweep the floors at this point in time in my career, but if I have to, I will. Um, so I think that's really more of just kind of my philosophy was something that it was just ingrained in me and, and you know, it was just kind of... Um, you know, the way that I came through and, and came into healthcare was just, that's just kind of how you do stuff. Yeah, yeah. Paul, well, um, so obviously now I'm at Kraft doing business development, but back in the old days, you know, with Gosselin and Martin Associates, we would do a lot about career ladders to try to promote that this opportunity exists. And as Paul said, he came out of the trades, and, and this I think is, we're trying to fill that pipeline like your rise from the trades into manager, director, progressive responsibility. Now, you know, you're at Leahy, which is a big system. Your path is one that I hope more people can follow because it's what's really needed these days. Um, yeah, I think the challenge with the trades is, is that it's, um, people want instant gratification. And um, the trades, uh, well, one, it's, a, it's very difficult. It's a, it's a hard way to make a living. People kind of don't understand that it's a it's manual labor you know, uh, you know a lot of overhead work a lot of climbing ladders a lot of heavy lifting um, so people you know it wears down on people so I would say that the trades in general you know whereas you know, people that go to mass maritime or they you know have certain certain pedigrees they 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 kind of push their kids to go there like if you're a lawyer you want your kid to be a lawyer if you're a doctor you want them to be a doctor and I think a lot of the trades like the older trades people like myself don't want that for their kids. And so they kind of, because it is a hard life and you see, you know, you start watching these guys that are, you know, in their 50s and they're limping and their shoulders are all messed up. And, you know, so people kind of, kind of moved away from it. And I think, especially over the last 20 years, um, college has become, it was like the priority. Like you had to go to college, you had to get a degree, you can't go any, you know, if, when I was growing up, it was like, there was a high school diploma, and probably the same with you, you know, you, you yeah. can't even be a garbage man if you don't have a high school right. diploma. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, now it's like, if you don't have a master's degree, you might not be able to get a job. Um, so it's really, I think that's kind of bad with, you know, how hard it is, you know, it's a four-year apprenticeship, it's, you know, you're, it, it, you're in the elements, there's a lot of, there's a lot of learning, and people, I, I think, underestimate 
how intelligent you have to be to do a lot of those trades. It's, it's a complicated work, and, and it's not just because you couldn't do anything else. People have a passion for it, and they're really good at it. Yeah. Uh, so it's a. So I think we're seeing a shift right now where a lot of younger kids are coming up and looking at it, going, well, "Do I really want to spend three hundred thousand dollars in college to go work at you know a minimum wage job for the next ten years?" Or you know, look at what they're making, you know, being an electrician or a plumber, or you know. So I think we're going to see a shift, hopefully, in the next four or five years, where you know, statistically, it's some crazy. Like you know, by next year, there's like the state of Massachusetts is going to need like sixty thousand plumbers and thirty-seven thousand yeah. electricians. It's, it's it's staggering, like the amount of people that are going to be retired over the next ten years. So, um, you know. I think it's a, I think it's a good path for some, and then I think some people, you know, are better off to go to college. It's just kind of you gotta kick the tires a little bit, yeah. and see what works better for you. Craft provides strategic real estate solutions that enable organizations to get the most out of their physical infrastructure. At Craft, the difference is we're not just advisors; we're operators. Our expertise in strategic asset advisory, project management, regulatory preparedness and finding operational efficiencies allows us to provide organizations with end-to-end -end visibility and insight into their real estate portfolios and physical assets. Please visit us at www.cref.com. You know, we've done a lot of shows on the Healthcare Facilities Network. We've done podcasts on the High Reliability Podcast Network where I'm, you know, that we've, we talk about the degree a lot and do you need the degree and, and I've always argued and you're one of those people who I always have in the back of my mind when we would work with an organization that says, no, they need a degree. Why do they need a degree? They didn't have an answer for that. Right. You just need it and you're right. one of those guys that said, right. listen, you're going to tell me that this person right. doesn't have what it takes to, you know, to lead your organization because he doesn't have a degree. That's crazy. And I agree with you. I think it is shifting back. Almost by necessity. If they don't want them, they're going to have to. You're going to need them. Well, I think, I think a key driver to that, and I would like to see this in my lifetime anyway, and it's, I know other states kind of do this, like New Hampshire really, they don't have, in Massachusetts you have trade schools in high school. Yeah. Um, so when you get out of you know, high school, you're already, you got your, you got your hours, you know, your related hours usually, or most of them, and then you can start your apprenticeship on the actual physical hours. But it doesn't, that's not a degree. And Whereas I think they need to move towards where, like, to get, you know, like an electrical license, a plumber's license, you know, an HVAC license is a degree program where you have a bachelor's degree that, or it's an equivalent because you spent four years, you know, I have to go to four years of school and four years of apprenticeship so that I can sit for a test and get my license. Yeah. So it's no different than, you know, going to college and just a different career path. So I think that if they do that, it would, that would go a long way with, because then you would have, like, for someone like myself who moved from that side to the management side, it like to have a degree in my pocket would be it would have been an easier road than not having that degree because then I have to work three times harder to get to that, you know, to get the trust factor because I don't have the credentials. And as you know, a former HR manager yourself is if a, if someone says, hey, this is a minimum required of a master's license, and someone sends an application and it doesn't meet that, it goes into the circular file holder. And it never even gets, you don't even get a chance to be able to come forward and speak no. what you can do. Um, so I think that if they could, if the, the feds or whatever could make like a, a, a that type of, make that a decree program and see a lot more people going into it. That's a great point. Yeah, and we're going to need it, right? Yeah, you have to. <laughs> no, but you're exactly right. And so we could continue to talk about this because Paul's got lots of interesting insights, but he does have a deadline or he has a, a hard out. So let's just transition. Paul is a. Uh, Nihi's president now. Tell us a little bit about this conference. So what are, you know, what, what is the theme of the conference? How is the conference going? And, and, you know, what are some of the challenges in putting on a conference for a volunteer organization? Uh, well, I mean, the, the conference is uh, for people that have never uh, had the experience of, of coming to a Nihi's conference. Um, it's a great opportunity to learn, uh, to network with, um, a group of people that are in the same boat you're in and understand the struggles that you're living with. Healthcare is a hard, you know, it's a hard industry. Uh, it's going through a lot of changes right now. So, you know, misery loves company. So, you know, <laughs> we get to we get to come together and, and, and talk about our woes with each other and know that we're not alone in, the, in, the, in this universe. Uh, so it's really like, but it's a it's a, and I I've, I've done this. You know, I've come to conferences now for a number of years, and so have you. And, 
you know, and even some of the younger folks that I've brought through and, you know, have been mentoring over the years, you know, when they come in, it's, you know, the first conference is almost overwhelming. You don't know anybody. There's yeah. stuff all over the place. And, and then, you know, I always laugh and I say, just wait, like two or three more years, you'll know everybody in here. <laughs> right. And, you know, it's like, so I, I remember my first conference was in, I believe it was Burlington, Vermont, and I showed up. I didn't know anybody. I was by myself. And, you know, now it's like I pretty much know everybody in the building. So, and that's a cool experience. And, and I, I can't stress that enough like for people that, you know, to come in and be able to network and talk to a group of your peers and with the range of experience. Some of these folks have been in healthcare for 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, they've gone through, you know, 10 code books at this point in time, you know, and all the joint commission and all the different rules. And so to have that at your disposal and be able to come into a, you know, a place like this and have that level of knowledge at your disposal and with them wanting to give you that is I think is well worth coming you know to the conference yep. um, you know I think and then it's the same thing we get you know we're the, we're the second re most regulated industry outside of nuclear energy in the country um, you know codes are changing rapidly uh, we're looking at you know in the, in the near future probably adopting a newer version of the code so like being able to come here and meet with the experts um, that do this for a living and kind of you know, keep you up to, up to speed and tell you what's coming down the pipeline and help you better prepare yourself um, so that you're making changes now so that it's not a shock to your, your organization and your teams as it happens. So we're, we're, we're proactively moving towards you know, the changes versus reacting when it happens, which can be very costly to your organization. Yeah. So I think that's another you know, real benefit of, of coming to these types of, types of like conferences and you know, every year we have, we're New England based, so like every year it's in a different state that's all part of New England. So next year it's going to be in Massachusetts, this year it's in Vermont, it would be in Rhode Island, Connecticut, you know, Maine. Um, so we get to see the different areas and, you know, experience the different, different places in our, in our wonderful New England area, you know, and it's, uh, you know, this, this has also been an awesome, like, place to be at. It's a really nice place. I don't know if you've never been to Stowe, I highly recommend you come up and take a look at it. It's beautiful. Yeah, if you've never been, as Paul says, uh, we are, the ski mountain is over there, so if you've been to Stowe, if you've skied up here, that is exactly where we are, the, uh, the lodge in the middle. You know, you brought something up that was interesting to me. I just thought about this. Because um, you do, you see a lot of the same people year after year, and occasionally you see new people coming in, but just based on the discussion we had, you know, we know that there's a lot of new, like, healthcare organizations simply they can't hire anybody. They're bringing people in without healthcare experience into the facilities world. Sure. You know, as you were talking, and I was thinking, hopefully we start to draw some of those people to these conferences because they're at like the biggest risk, <laughs> right? I mean, and, and and they need the education and they need the networking because you folks always help each other out. Somebody gives you a phone call, you're calling them back. I'm wondering, and again, this really isn't a question, I'm just kind of throwing it out there, but how do we draw in those people who, like, they don't know this exists, and I don't, like, they've got to get up to speed somehow. Um, well, <laughs> we do, uh, so as part of the organization, so we have a, you know, a, an executive board, um, and we have a, you know, regular board, and, and on that is a, you know, we have a committee that is a membership committee. Yeah. Um, so we do a lot of outreach, like what we call, you know, we, we make phone calls to hospitals that, you know, may not be represented or underrepresented, in, you know, of this, for this organization, introduce ourselves. Um, membership is free for active members, so it doesn't, you know, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, this year, we, you know, we realize with, you know, the current financial situation in our organizations across the country right now, um, there's no money for, you know, for conferences and travel. So this year, our organization, uh, we've given out almost $50,000 in scholarship money so we can get people to come to these conferences. Um, we issued 25, you know, full paid conference fees for this conference um, wow. to get people that hospitals would not pay so they could get here and get the education. Um, so, you know, we, we try to, you know, extend our network and reach out to people that are, that, you know, as they come in and, and you know, and hopefully our, you know, those new members start to talk and, you know, yeah. we kind of, we kind of try to outreach as much as we can. Um, you know, unfortunately, we can't reach everybody all the time, but we're, we try. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, so 50K in scholarships, that's a big, yes. that's a big number. Now, yes. Obviously, I'm assuming you can't hit the 50K, that's part of it, but that's a, yeah. that's an outlay that really, that should be, um, 
you know, congratulate me. Thank You're you. not looking for self promotion. No. I know that, but that's right. a big nugget. Um, yeah, that's, that's that's the but that's the you know that is what this organization is about. It's it's about um, knowledge and, and teaching you know the next generation of healthcare engineers like what how to do this, like how to how to be a professional in this industry and what it means and you know that that you know patient care and, and being a part of that is is a, is a is a, it's a calling. Like I don't I don't think it's really like a job. It's something that you either love or you don't. Like it's, <laughs> right. You know. Yeah. Um, so I think that like for us, that's really what this mission. That's our mission is to really like is to educate and to train people how to be successful facilities engineers in, in healthcare. Yeah. No, I know that you know, through our talk, talking yesterday, I think that you know, the vendor show and we had a booth, um, we had a booth there, so if you stop by and talk, thank you. Thank you, you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, no, thank you. Um, but it seems like you, you fill that up. Is it, is it a challenge these days to get that vendor participation, you know, to get them that? part with our money, because I understand that there was kind of a waiting list, not everybody got in, so a good problem to have, but yeah. is it a challenge trying to get vendor participation, vendor support? Um, well, luckily um, for us right now, because we've been around for quite a while, so it's, um, and we have some amazing supporting members like, you know, like yourself and, and people that are really engaged in, as well in the industry, so they, they're as serious in the worlds that they work in, and, and you know, architecture or engineering, uh, you know, sourcing, whatever it is, like they, they love, they're, they're passionate about that in, in, in the healthcare world. So uh, it's the same thing, like we, you become friends with, you don't know any of these people and then before you know, you, you know, you're, 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 I'm, I'm dating myself now, your Rolodex is, is you know, it's pretty, it's pretty beefy. Um, I still like the Rolodex. Yeah, right, it's easy, easy to find stuff, right? Yeah. Exactly. It's right I, don't, there. I don't have to remember where I filed it. No. Um, so, I, I, like, I think that, um, you know, we've been, we've been very lucky as far as, you know, people wanting to participate. Uh, with that being said, we always have to be conscious that, you know, we're offering value for the dollar and that, you know, they're getting, you know, like uh, active members and facilities engineers are, you know, taking the time to meet with them and actually, like, you know, developing relationships with them, which ultimately is what we're trying to do here. Um, so I think that it's a, it's a good balance. I, I think we've been, we've, we've been very fortunate. And, and, you know, like you said, we have some outstanding supporting members that have been, you know, long time, you know, supporting members and, and really participate and make these make these kinds of conferences happen. So, um, you know, luckily, we'll, you know, hopefully that stays up and, and you know, we have, to, we have to pay attention to it. And, um, we have, you know, uh, meetings with our supporting members. We have a supporting member liaison on our board uh, that, like, communicates and comes back to us so that they have a voice on the board as, as supporting members so we can hear what's working, what's not working. Um, and, you know, you can't make everybody happy all the time, but we really do appreciate like everything that you guys bring for us and that we couldn't do these types of events without you. Yeah. How do you challenge? How do you challenge? How do you balance? So you know, Lakey is a big system. Your your hospital is a busy hospital. It's a big hospital. You have all the challenges that every director of facilities has. So you got that full time job. You have children. You're a volunteer president. You know, you're the president. And he's how do you balance? How do you balance everything so that you can do everything you need to do? You no, know, I mean. I think it's just a matter of what I like. I'm, I'm truly lucky that I have a I have a great team both on the Nihi side and at, at my work and in my home life. Um, so like you know I can be here because I can trust my team at work. To, you know that they can run while I'm, while I'm away. Uh, you know my, my wife is taking care of the kids while I'm away. You know we're working you know tremendously hard here to make make this conference go off and um, you know make sure people are having a good time and that everything's being done the way that it's supposed to be. So. I think that's really without that I don't I don't know that I could balance it, but I, it's it's just it's the team of people. It's not just me balancing. It's like everybody kind of working in the same direction. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good answer. What are what are your as the president of Nihis? Um, what are some of the challenges that Nihis and really any member based volunteer organization faces in twenty twenty four as we head into twenty twenty five? Well, I, I, and I think a lot of it is, is we're, we are a volunteer organization and it, we need that. So I think that's the challenge is to keep people engaged um, and to keep, keep the organization growing so that you know, people come in, see a value with it, and then want to participate and volunteer. Because um, it is a lot of work and, and you know, there's, no, there's no money involved in it. You're yeah. doing it on your own time or you know, there's a lot of time that you're taking away from other things you could be doing. 
Um, so I think that the organization is really that's the that's the challenge is, is keeping you know members engaged and keeping them coming to the meetings and, and wanting to participate at a board level so that you can keep all of the different functions you do as well. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> keep the things rolling. Last question for Paul DeVillar. Paul is the director of plan operations, Lady Medical Center. He's the um, also president of the East. How, how big is this? This isn't the last question. There's another one. But for the folks, how big is Lady? How big is your facility? Um, well, my, my main campus is uh, uh, 350 beds. It's about 1.2 million square feet. Um, and then I have a, uh, another campus uh, about 30 miles away in, in Peabody that's uh, 225,000 square feet. And that's like a 10 bed, like kind of a, a more of an outpatient. They do have a, um, an EB, but it's more outpatient at that, that location. Uh, we're a trauma one. Um, we have a pellet hat. Um, we're we're uh, pretty busy. And like most hospitals, you know, we're full all the time, which is horrible because people are in the hospital, but it's good for good for, good for my job. <laughs> well, we, we know, excuse me, we know there's, well, I was going to say there's a lot of job security. There is job security, then there's not job security, but that's right. again, <laughs> right. you know, it's yeah. a double-edged sword. There should be job security, um, but everybody's got finances that they're dealing with these days. Um, what's the theme of this conference, and, and why did you guys select it? Um, so there's a, I mean, so on this one here, it's the uh, innovation and capital revitalization thinking outside of the box. Um, so that's done. So we have, a, again, there's a, there's a planning committee um, that, uh, that the host state will be like the chair of. So um, Beth Sinu, who's, uh, you know, she's the uh, Vermont rep, was, you know, uh, spent a lot of time, you know, putting this together and organizing it. Um, and I, I'm involved, you know, in it and some of the other members of the board. So we meet, you know, a lot of monthly or, you know, as it gets closer, even more like every other week. And, and that's really, you just start talking about when you set the conferences and the names. Um, you're kind of looking at, like, what's going on in the industry, what's going on in the world, you know, during COVID, and, you know, like some of those things. It was like, it was, it was you know, you know, navigation, navigating the sea of change, you know, when we were at the Cape the last time. So, you know, because a lot of changes are coming and the industry is changing. So a lot of it is just kind of like, you know, we brainstorm and we come up with what we think is a, you know, a good option, you know, a good topic for what we're dealing with in the industry at the given time. And then it kind of goes from there. Yeah. What is there, last question, this one, definitely, because Paul's going to get out of here. What is something about being president of a volunteer organization that you've learned that people may not no, something that you didn't know coming in. I would say, um, yeah, you, the work that you put in, what you get out of it is far greater than what you may think. Um, I think that it's it's been um, it's like it's a tremendous amount of work, and, and there's a lot of things going on, and a lot of moving parts, and you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of personalities that make this this role. Um, but the amount of, of stuff that I've gotten out of this and, and the pride of seeing, you know, events like this go off and, and, you know, seeing people grow and watching them, you know, from that birth conference they come to and, you know, 10 years later you, you see them and they're still doing it. I think that's what you get, that's what I get out of it anyway. I think that it's, uh, you know, it's it's humbling to say the least. That's nice. Well, I thank my guest, Paul DeViller. Thank you so much. For joining me to be present. The reason I wanted Paul on too, Paul, and it didn't come across. If we had more time, I would have talked I, about I still got more time to go. I don't know. It's a to pass. We were going to Paul has a tremendous soft skill base as well. You got the technical base. You need the soft skill base. He's got a great way to communicate. And since you said I could ask one more question. Yeah, absolutely. You're very um, honest. You're blunt. He's not in a bad way, but you, you kind of tell it the way it is. Did that approach come naturally? Did you, have you always been that way? Did you have to learn? And, and does that approach have to change as the world gets more, my word, not yours, touchy feely? Or, you know, or, um, have you had to switch your style a bit? Yeah, well, I think it's uh, one that, that is more of my natural personality. I think I, I, I probably developed it more as I matured and got a little older. I don't, I probably was in exactly like that. I'd say 21, when it was, yeah. as I kind of grew, I got more confident in, in my opinion, I guess, or my thoughts. So I, I would then not be afraid to speak my mind. Um, but I think that just like any other, any other, you know, management style, you have to adapt your style to like, to, to work for the person that you're working with. Um, and not everybody, you know, some people you can 
yell at. Some people you can't yell at. Some people, you know, so you, I think that's where, I, and I tell, you know, every manager that I have working for me that's worked for me is that you have to learn to adapt to the other person's style and not try to adapt them to your style because it works for me and that's why I'm me, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not going to work for you. Yeah. So I think people, managers in general, sometimes get hung up on, you know, trying to, you know, either run with an iron fist or they're, you know, too nice or, because they don't really understand, you know, it's a, it, it's, it, there's a psychology based on all of this and there's a science behind it. I mean, business is a science. It's not just kind of, you know, you have to learn where you fit into that. And I'm far from perfect. I mean, I'm always learning. Yeah. Um, Who's not? Right. And, you know, I, like, I've made mistakes and hell, I mean, there's probably 20 people out there to be like, you can't talk to me like that. <laughs> um, but there's, uh, you know, but, and, you know, and, but I, you know, and I think that's also critical for a manager or someone in a position of power is you have to be able to like self reflect mm. and, and tell yourself when you made a mistake and, and be able to say, Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't, that really didn't come off the way that I wanted it to, or, you know, like being able to read kind of like just training. I'm sure you, you had that before. It's, um, you know, it's really just being able to read who you're talking to and what kind of personality they are and try to get the most out of them for their capabilities. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, your keynote yesterday, Commander Scott Mick, uh, Waddle. Scott Waddle was tremendous. I mean, I mean we wouldn't even go into it, but just a, a submarine yeah. commander who um, breached the submarine and ended up killing nine students on a boat. Uh, yeah. Find his story. The, 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 his keynote yesterday was tremendous. Yeah, highly tremendous. recommend. We had, you know, we're so glad that he came. I highly recommend if you haven't heard him, like you said, look it up um, and, and check out his story. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, what that was it look like the right thing or do it, yeah, I think it was do the right thing, but it's, it's like Captain Waddle or that's his name. So you can he's out there and um, an impressive guy. Yeah, it was a it was a great keynote. It was a great conference, and so next year in Massachusetts, what do you, what's your role? In, are you are you serving another term? Or? I will. I, yeah. So I got a, uh, we had an unfortunate uh, person leave the. Industry, like uh, that would have been. I, this would have. I would have supposed to be president elect this year and president next year, and because of the change over, I became the president to fill in, and then my real term starts in January. Lucky Paul. So I got a two. I got a two year <laughs> volunteerism. So we'll be back. Uh, he'll be back next year with me when we're done. Absolutely. Say, where is it next year? Uh, we're in Massachusetts. We haven't picked a place yet, but we will be in Massachusetts someplace. Perfect. I appreciate the time. My guest Paul Deviller has given me. I am Peter Martin. Base president. Still difficult to say. The Vice President of Business Development for Kraft, as always, thank you for watching the Healthcare Facilities Network, and we will be back in the future with another episode. Take care. Thanks, Paul.